Our next speaker is Dr. Steve Zazel. And a um, little known story about Dr. Zazel, he was one of my old professors, so this is quite an honor. Um, and Dr. Zazel has extensive experience in nutrition research as well as genetics, epigenetics, and metabolomics. He plans to discuss genetically based nutrition interventions and share his perspective on addressing metabolic issues with medical foods. Thank you, Wendy. It's a pleasure to see how well you've done. It's a good Chapel Hill education. So, so I was asked to try to work out how, how could you think about developing an application in industry right now, putting aside how complicated and how much more work we have to do in this field. You've got to start somewhere. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I'm thinking about doing this. And I, I want to reveal uh, a number of conflicts. I'm, I'm working with a number of companies who are trying to think about how to get into the nutrigenetics field and, and thinking with them. And there's one company, Zethera, that I own equity in and, and I'm uh, in early startup uh, phase with. But that uses some of the thinking. Now, again, we've heard over and over again how metabolically different people are. That SNPs that we have, each of us in this room has about 50,000 SNPs out of the millions that exist. And that we inherited them from our ancient ancestors. So we came from different ancestry. We have different metabolic uh, polymorphisms that are metabolically functional. And uh, here's one I'm going to talk to you a little bit about later, but you can see quite a difference of distribution with red and green being people who have uh, the variant that makes you more inefficient in this gene and yellow being the, uh, the not having that variant. You can see if you came from Africa, you're very different than if you came from indigenous Americas or Europe or Asia. Um, and so populations, as I said, differ in many of these SNPs. And the thinking that I'm going to present to you is, is that we already know a lot about metabolism and nutrition. And we don't have to be overwhelmed by how complicated things are if we say we can start by understanding metabolic pathways. And we know nutrients have to transit these pathways. That each of these pathways depends on a number of genes. We know what those genes are. And we know how different pathways interact with each other quite nicely. So we can predict that polymorphisms that affect the function of genes in a specific pathway will have a metabolic marker, a change in the building up of the precursor and less of the product, or something like that. And so we can cut down on the complexity of what we look at and increase the power by having pre-hoc hypotheses based on our understanding of metabolism. And some of these polymorphisms will be functionally active in, and change the affinity site or the regulator of a gene and change function and create a roadblock or sometimes a, a super efficient pathway. And so again, we could then say, if we know this, we can ask, how do we step around that? And so. One thought is, is you could develop nutritional solutions or medical foods if they meet all the other criteria for the FDA that are specifically designed to bypass each of the roadblocks that you identify as being associated with a health condition related to nutrition. And I'll take you through that. Now, first thing I want you to realize is, is that not all SNPs cause functional changes. One of the genes I'm going to talk to you about, PEMPT, has more than 1,000 polymorphisms identified in humans. but only some selected subset of them, so far maybe 10 that we've identified, are functionally important because they change the binding site or they change uh, a response element that I'll talk more about. So, but if you have a nutrient that causes a roadblock, it creates a bottleneck perhaps, and you have less product coming through, more precursor building up. But diet can hide that from you. So if I have an inefficiency and I'm eating enough to bypass the step, or I'm eating enough to push enough through the bottleneck, it's not going to show up as a functionally important SNP. It's only when I am challenged by having low 
amounts in the diet that any inefficiencies become important. And I'll show you an example of that from our research. So that's why GWAS has been abysmal at identifying nutritionally relevant SNPs because it's combining people taking a lot of the nutrient with people who are challenged for the nutrient, put them together, and they come up with no significance because they melded out their significance. So I'm going to talk to you about choline, of course. And, <laughs> but I'm going to talk to you because I'm going to show you how our thinking about why they were outliers, why they were responders, not responders, led us to find genetic polymorphisms that were important. And you could do this with all of your work. Choline, again, it has an AI. It has uh, FDA labeling. It's important for liver and muscle. I'll show you all of that in a minute. You can make choline in your liver through this uh, uh, enzyme, which is catalyzed by the gene PEMT, or, or coded by the gene PEMT. You can get it in your diet, and foods like liver, eggs, and everything we told you not to eat because of high cholesterol um, uh, are sources of choline. And Haynes shows that almost all components of the population are not meeting the recommended intakes, and uh, that's especially important, I'll show you later, in pregnancy and lactation. Uh, only, kids, only small kids who are drinking a lot of milk are, are almost achieving their recommendations. So it's a problem nutrient. And it's a nutri nutri nutrition science caused problem nutrient because we told people not to eat those foods when we were trying to help their cholesterol levels. So again, these are the recommendations, about half a gram a day. And when we did the first study to try to ask, do humans really require this, we put them in the hospital, we took the nutrient away, and asked who got sick, we noticed that young women needed less choline. We could go 42 days without choline, and 56% of them didn't get sick. Only 44% got sick, but most men and postmenopausal women got sick. So again, we could have ignored that, or we could have combined uh, that and said, we've got 56 who do, 44 who don't, so that's a fuzzy data and we can't draw a conclusion about whether this is an essential nutrient. But we went and asked what's different about women, uh, but let me just say what we, we found in the people who did get sick, they developed fatty liver, a 28% increase by MRI was our cutoff. They developed apoptosis in many cells, ly lymphocytes, liver, and muscle cells. I, I should say most presented with fatty liver and liver damage, about 10% presented with this muscle phenotype, and I'll talk about that later. So we ask, why is it that 56% of young women don't need it? And I went to Harvard Medical School, and estrogen seemed to be an obvious answer. And indeed, this gene that turns on uh, the production, this, this gene is induced by estrogen. It has eight estrogen response elements. And it's turned on at exactly the concentrations of estrogen that are achieved during pregnancy. The red arrow shows what you achieve in the second trimester of pregnancy, and it's maximally activated. This is uh, in human, and we have rat, mouse genes as well. So if that's the case, and women can turn on this gene to make their own with estrogen, why do 44% still get sick when deprived of choline? Well, it turns out they all have a polymorphism, or a set of polymorphisms, in the estrogen response element for this gene, and they're reduced to the sad state of men that even though they have high estrogen, they don't, can't respond to it, and they have to eat choline because they can't up their production during the high demand period of pregnancy and lactation. So here is a genetic polymorphism in this gene that helps to predict the women who better have this in their prenatals and et cetera. And this year, the AMA, for the first time at their convention, voted to recommend that prenatals contain choline based on this type of data. So here we, did, we, we got a parasites from motorcyclists who um, unfortunately donated their livers by not wearing helmets, and we could get the different genotypes, and you can see that the genotype with two alleles of the polymorphism don't respond to estrogen at all. The heads somewhat, and the homozygotes do respond. This, this gene is, as I said earlier, distributed differently around the world. So in Europe, seven, and America, 72% of women have one or more alleles of this gene, 22% are homozygous variant for the gene. In Africa, 
Very few are. And we published a paper on, on that. It turns out the indigenous African diet in the Gambia is very low in choline, and it was selected against this polymorphism. In Europe, where every mother fed eggs, or in the Maasai, uh, uh, Africans who eat milk and uh, blood, um, there wasn't a selection against this gene because they got it in their diet. Now, women are really special. And I just told you that some women during pregnancy are going to have a problem because they can induce this gene, and we can test that with a genetic test. What's the effect? Well, here is a mouse. Um, <coughs> pregnant mice fed a low choline diet, and we're looking at the baby's neural progenitor cells, which in this mouse model glow bright green because we put a fluorescent protein in. You can see there is a huge difference in the number of neural progenitor cells on the 17-day mouse that is formed. And that, for the rest of their life, affects uh, memory. And this probably occurs in humans. Here is a Harvard School of Public Health study where they looked at choline availability during the first and second trimester of pregnancy and correlated to performance on a cognitive test, the WRAML2. And you see this seems to be a dose response. And the yellow line shows what the recommendation is for intake in those pregnant women. And as I said, the AMA has just recommended that that be taken in. So here you could see if you were thinking about developing a company, well, you've got a gene test, a very obvious intervention, and pretty useful. And, and it's not a rare mutation like phenylketonuria. It is 72% of women in the, in the US would have a, well, at least one allele for this gene. So if we obviously. One SNP analysis is useful. But when we evolve the field of nutrigenomics, commercially and academically, we'll start to be able to do patterns of genes because we know it isn't one pathway, and there are multiple hits in one pathway, and there are ways to bypass with another pathway to spare or increase our requirements for nutrients. So we'll have to start recognizing multiple pathways. And I want to show you an example of this. So first of all, when we finished our human study, and we ask, why did some men go faster and de deplete faster and other men not, or women who got sick? We found there were a number of polymorphisms in almost every step of the choline pathway that when they were, not, they were functionally not working, you had inefficient metabolism, you needed more choline, and you were more at greater risk of becoming depleted and developing liver or muscle problems. And Marie Caudill, you saw the paper from MTHFR. She's done one on it increases your choline requirement as well. So um, the next question is, why did some people get liver disease and some people get muscle disease? And instead of just saying that's the way it is, we took responders and non-responders and asked what's different about them. And what we found is, first of all, um, you need choline to export fat from the liver. You make a wrapper and out of phosphatidylcholine, and if you don't make that, the liver all sits in the, the fat sits in the cytosol and can't be exported from the liver. And um, there are a number of pathways that would have to do with how fast you can package and, and what you need for choline. So um, the people who were made choline deficient couldn't wrap it up, and they developed fatty liver. I showed you the kind of data we got. But we went then and said, if we took another population, people who had a liver biopsy, and we had 800 liver biopsies from people who were seen either in a, uh, for a reason that meant they had some, an abdominal exploration, and they, gra and they grabbed a piece of liver at the time, or they were specifically seen because they were thought to have fatty liver. And um, we then genotyped them, and we looked at, and the different colors tell you how many alleles of different th things and going up and down are a, a, a range of genes that were important. And we start out with the hypothesis the people who had the choline polymorphisms would show up, and we could predict the most likely to get fatty liver and the least likely. And what we found is totally useless in lean people. If you're lean and not making a lot of fat in your liver, you can afford to be inefficient at exporting it. As soon as you got to higher BMIs, you're making a lot more fat in your liver from those excess calories, and now export became important. So if you had high BMI and these polymorphisms, we could predict that you would have fatty liver. And so there's a low group, and this is the highest group, and in between we had quintiles 
and we could accurately predict it. And we found then we could do even better if we didn't just use my pre hoc hypothesis that it was something to do with choline metabolism, and we used least squares um, analyses and came up with other genes that if you use those polymorphisms, you improved your prediction rate. So we went from about a 70 percent prediction rate to a 95 percent prediction rate by including genes in other pathways. And it turned out those pathways were enlightening. They were fatty acid transport genes and uh, 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 some bile synthesis genes because you dump lipid out in the bile, et cetera. So it turns out you can use the thought process of your pre hoc hypotheses, find that you predict well, and then you can say, can I improve my prediction by going through all the polymorphisms measured and what adds to it, and then include that. So now I have a gene test in 21 genes in men, 19 genes in women that lets me with 90 percent accuracy say you're going to develop fatty liver as you, or you're susceptible to fatty liver as you increase your calorie intake. So now I could say that I should bypass the metabolic defects in each of those pathways. I'll probably get 70 percent of the effect for bypassing the choline related ones, and I probably get another 20 percent by putting something together that bypasses all of them, and that would be the identification of a medical food, because it's hard to do that from normal dietary ingredients. But again, that genotype tells me who is going to have roadblocks, and I can bypass the roadblocks by just saying, look, they're accumulating X metabolite, and they can't make Y metabolite, so if I give them Y metabolite, I've solved their problem, theoretically. And it works if I give choline back to those people who developed fatty liver when they were choline deprived, their fatty liver went away. So then why did some of the 10 percent develop muscle defects? Well, it turned out every one of the ones who developed muscle defects had a problem in the transporter of choline into the muscle cell or in phosphorylating choline once it entered the muscle cell. Like glucose in choline metabolism, you phosphorylate it to give it a charge so it can't leak out of the cell. So I could predict who's going to get rhabdomyolysis, and we've gone on uh, working to show that uh, not only these genes but MTHFD1 seems to predict who's going to develop rhabdomyolysis as measured by leakage of creatine kinase from muscle cells, um, and that when during exercise people break down their muscles more if they have these polymorphisms and are eating a diet lower in choline, and as I showed you from NHANES, a whole lot of the population is eating a diet lower in choline. So again, another medical food or a nutritional solution that says what pathways are blocked, let's give them the solution, and we have a disease that doesn't have a lot of other solutions, um, uh, muscle breakdown with exercise, and so it's a good use of a, uh, developing a new product. So again, a gene guided de design for an intervention based on what we know about metabolism. I'm going to give you one more, and, and I wasn't going to do this, but after the brilliant mitochondrial talk this morning, I wanted to do something on mitochondria. So when, whenever we do an experiment in humans, like that big choline deficiency study, we then, when we identify genes that seem, polymorphisms that seem to be important, we then knock them out in a mouse and ask, was there anything else we should have looked for in the human that we didn't think of looking for? So we knocked out choline dehydrogenase because that was one of the genes that affected choline requirement, and those mice developed horrible-looking mitochondria in their sperm. They were infertile. Their sperm couldn't swim. And they couldn't make ATP in their sperm, depending on whether they had uh, one allele were HETs or homozygous knockouts, um, ATP being the currency for energy. Um, and we found that we could restore the sperm function in the mouse by giving them the metabolite beyond their block. This is a nuclear gene. The protein resides in the inner mitochondrial leaflet. So then we said, look, let's test our idea. Are there men who have this problem? This is the sperm bank card in uh, Amsterdam. That's how they deliver it. But this polymorphism exists in about 5 to 9 percent of men, depending on what lineage they come from, so pretty common. Their mitochondria look terrible, too, if they have the polymorphism. 
And if they have two alleles of the polymorphism, they, they don't make ATP. If they have one allele, they make half as much ATP. So they're 5 to 10 percent of men are walking around with low ATP in their sperm. We haven't gone on to ask, are they less fertile? But they probably are, because their sperm just don't swim well. We've showed that. So again, you could imagine, if you were trying to think of a company, and I was, um, you could do a test for some portion of men who aren't able to have a baby and say, look, I can use ATP in sperm as a marker, a biomarker for a problem. And probably what works in the mouse will work in the men, and we have to do that clinical trial in these men to show it reverses. But again, the thought policy is take what you know about metabolism and use that to predict what nutrigenetic test should work. And if it does, that's great. And you can look on outside of the, out the lamp light by then later on doing an analysis with all the other polymorphisms to say, could you do better at predicting what's going to work and what isn't? So we need in the future to develop better methods for working on complex metabolic pathways. I think we could introduce metabolome to understand changes in the metabolites as well. But we could do this with the pathways we know well. And the only reason I'm showing you a lot of choline is that's all I know about. But if I were an expert in vitamin D, I would look at vitamin D receptor polymorphism, vitamin D transporter polymorphisms, et cetera. And I could develop the same story for people who are having trouble in vitamin D, I'm sure, and then design interventions that bypass those specific inefficiencies in metabolism. And in GWAS, we need to come up with a way to include diet information. And at my university, as in almost every university, this precision medicine initiative, they're going to measure everybody's genes and everybody's metabolome and everybody's medical record. And they're not thinking one iota of collecting nutritional data. But without it, I'm not going to know who is being challenged, low choline and having the polymorphisms. They're going to have rhabdomyolysis, high choline and having the muscle polymorphisms. They're going to look perfectly normal. When I do GWAS, I'm going to get no significant changes. We have to figure out a way to get them to include nutrition information. And again, I think we can um, identify many more pathways than I, that I said. And I think for those of us asking, how do we get into medical foods, the prototype medical food was talked about by Jose earlier today. It's for those rare mutations that cause amino aciditopathies or like phenylketonuria. We then have a medical food designed to eliminate that problem, amino acid, and the person takes it for their life and spends 2,000 or 25,000 on it. But that's the prototype, a metabolic defect caused by a genetic defect that you can bypass by a nutritional solution. And here, if you had to take a shot at medical foods and a product in nutrigenomics, I feel that the strategy of saying, look, this is exactly the same thing. I just, instead of having a rare mutation, have common polymorphisms causing a genetic defect. And then I design my intervention to specifically deal with all of those uh, pathways that are blocked. That's not something easily delivered in a normal diet or necessarily easy to calculate. And so therefore, it's the perfect uh, fit to the FDA's <coughs> current definition of what a medical food should be. And it's a good place to start in the process. This work was done by a lot of people in my research group. And we work at the Nutrition Research Institute, part of North Carolina. And the whole institute is devoted to trying to build the catalog of precision nutrition in many different fronts. This work was only part of it. And I'm still green, so I talked fast enough. <laughs> <laughs>